Such as you and your captains hail from a region long known to support the Balliol clan. May we invite you to continue your support and uphold our rightful claim. Damn the Balliol clan! We have beaten the English. We have beaten the English. Because you won't stand together. Because you what will you do? Together. I will invade England. What will you do? And defeat the English on their own ground. And defeat the English on their own ground. <laughs> invade? It is impossible. Why? Invade. Is impossible. Why is that impossible? Why? You're so concerned with squabbling for the scraps so from Longshank's table that you've missed your God-given right to something better. Right There's a difference better. between us. There's you think the people of this country exist to provide you, you with position. This country exists to provide I you think your position exists to provide those people with freedom. And I go to make sure that they have it. And I go to make sure that they have it. <laughs> It's much to risk. And the common man that bleeds on the battlefield is he risk No. But from top to bottom, no. this country has got no sense in itself. It's uh, nobles share allegiance with England. It's clans war with each other. Right? If you make enemies on both sides of the border, you make enemies up there. We all end up dead. It's just a question of how. I want what you want, but we need the nobles. We need them. We need the nobles. We need them. Now tell me, what does that mean to be noble? <laughs> now tell me. Your title gives you claim to the throne of our country. Your title but men don't follow titles. But they follow courage. Now our people know you. Noble and common, they respect you. And if you would just lead you to freedom, lead them to freedom, they follow you. So would I. So would I. Now, the bad part about showing a clip from Braveheart is that people say, just shut up, let's watch the rest of the movie. <laughs> when are they going to make another movie like that? But I showed you that clip, and I've showed it many times in many different places because I love that line that says people don't follow titles. They follow what? Courage. And who was the leader here? Was it the man with all the titles and the roles or was it the guy who just went out and did it? We've talked about some heavy topics the last couple of weeks. We talked about wrestling with temptation which is constant where Paul basically says to us as men, men, me too. Romans chapter 7, I wrestle with this too. It's an ongoing battle and I want you to step up to it. Uh, last week we talked about a really tough subject about when you lose trust, how do you regain it? And it takes great perseverance and vision for the future to regain trust that's been eroded or lost. But today we want to talk about a little bit lighter topic. Well, it's not light, but it's at least a little bit more optimistic. And that is about being unapologetically male. Let's talk about our design. Let's talk about how God made us. I'll never forget this as a teenager. Uh, my dad was a pastor, and, and he had a young husband come to him who had been to a, some kind of a marriage conference, some kind of a, a Bible weekend. And he came back all excited, telling my dad that he said, I went to this conference, and I, I learned how I'm supposed to be the head of the household, how I'm supposed to lead, how there's supposed to be a chain of command in our marriage. And I'm, in, I'm coming home to tell my wife, that I'm the leader here, and, and you need to obey me, and you need to submit to me, because that's what the Bible says. 
<laughs> and my dad said to him, if you have to say it, you haven't got it. And I thought, what a brilliant statement. If you have to stand on your soapbox and say, I'm the leader here, it says something, doesn't it? What I love about this Braveheart clip is it shows the leader is the guy who doesn't have to say he's the leader. He's just been doing it, and he, can, and he plans to continue doing it. He's unapologetically male. He's strong. He's courageous and all that. Now, we're not trying to make you into Braveheart. We're not trying to say that's the model of manhood. We're not trying to make you into the gym rat who's got that tan chest and gold chain and, and walks around the room strutting. We're not trying to make you into a base jumper or a big game hunter or some model of manhood. What I want to talk about today is for you to just be the man that God created you to be. And, and I hope this doesn't come across as an exhortation to drag you into something that you don't want. Rather, I hope it's an invitation to become what you already want to be and allow you to, to shape what that looks like in your particular life. Because your wife and your children and your church and your community, our world needs men. We need men like you. Like I'm not saying you collectively, I'm saying you singularly. Your world needs a man like you who just wants to live unapologetically his design as a man. And there's all kinds of cultural forces against this, not to mention our own flesh, but uh, a, a, a renowned feminist, Camille Paglia, who is uh, probably not, well, she's not a friend to Christianity at all, but she's got some great insight. And she wrote an article called A Feminist Defense of Masculine Virtues, and she says, what you're seeing is how a civilization commits suicide. And what she's talking about is the feminist stamp on men that's basically saying men are just remedial women. Another woman has written a book called The War Against Boys, Christine Hoff Summers, and, and basically she's saying no, and we're seeing boys as defective girls. That there's something wrong with maleness, something wrong with manhood, and I love what Stu Weber said, when men are not men, a civilization fails. So we're not here today to measure biceps, you know. We're not here to talk about competing in, in deadlifting or some kind of, of macho thing. We're just saying, you know, whatever, however God created you as a man yourself, there's some universal and unapologetic ways we can enter into our own manhood. And I want to invite you into that today. And, uh, and talk with you about some, some challenges from Scripture that we see, some examples we see from Scripture. And we come to a, a passage that, that kind of kicks this off <clears throat> because the, the Scripture is integrated. It shows us an integrated world, and that integrated world is, is formed around what we call the, the digest of how God made the world, the moral character of the world, how it really works. And the moral digest of that is called the Ten Commandments. And if we look at the Ten Commandments, we're not just seeing ways uh, or rules to avoid trouble. What we're seeing is this is the design of how the world works. And so commandment number five says, Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now that's a command to all of us to, to honor our fathers and mothers. But here's the question. The opposite question is this. How can a man live so that his life is worthy of honor? So that our wives, our children, our community, our church, our friends, our neighbors will say, that man lived well. And how can I enter that unapologetically and joyfully with celebration? So I want to talk to you about four examples or four ways to be unapologetically male. And you won't have to say it because people will see it. And this is what we want, by the way. This is not imposing something on you that you dread. This is not like making you practice the piano before you go to school, which my mother made me do. I'm not bitter about that. Uh, anymore. <laughs> anymore, yeah. 
This is not putting something on you that's a straitjacket. This is really releasing you. And asking you to be honest with yourself and with God and say, God, how can I become what I really want in this kind of man? So the first thing is to aspire to be great. We all aspire to be great. I remember reading biographies and autobiographies in history as a, as a young boy thinking, I want to be great. I remember I asked a friend one time, don't you want to be great? And he said, huh? <laughs> now, I probably wanted to be great in the wrong ways. You know, I wanted somebody to write a book about me. But every man has a desire to leave a legacy of greatness. And it's not wrong. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. And, and the scenario is that, that uh, the mother of James and John had come and said to Jesus, listen, I want you to appoint, uh, I want you to designate one son to be the most valuable player, and I want you to appoint the other one to be the scoring leader. <laughs> Can you do that for me, Jesus? And Jesus said, well, it isn't mine to give, first of all. And then he gave this definition of greatness, verse 25. He said, but Jesus <laughs> called to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The wake-up call for us is that Jesus does not squash their desire to be great. He doesn't say, don't aspire to that. That's a wrong definition of, of what your life should be. Rather, Jesus says, I want to channel that greatness. And what does he say? He says, greatness is being a servant. It's being a slave. It's giving of yourself, just as I'm demonstrating that. And the great example of this, or one example in the New Testament, is Timothy. And if we look at Philippians chapter 2, I can't think of a better uh, recommendation for anyone. Paul is recommending that, that they, well, he's sending Timothy to the church in Philippi. And in chapter 2, verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned your welfare. Wouldn't you like someone to say that about you? There's nobody like him. Why? Because he's not out for himself. He's going to take interest in what you need. I know men like that. I, I've said, and this is not bragging, this is just the richness in which I live. I, I think I know at least 50 men that I could trust with my household. You know, to say, you know, if I was disabled or, you know, walking off the scene or something, my life was leaving, would you, would you take this and care for my property, my will, my wife? Now, some guys might be better at it than others, but I can think of, and who would I think of to do that? It would be a man who has an interest in serving others. I've had, I have some world-class friends, you know, some right here, and, and I'm, I'm blessed to know men this way, and they are great men, but there's no soundtrack to their life. There's no applause to most of what they do. I just know them to be great. Aspire to be great, man. Timothy is a model for us, but what we need to do to aspire to that is we need to expect God's greater reward which won't necessarily be in the perks and the position and the, the salary or the applause that we get immediately in this life. Aspire to be great. Keep doing what God gives you to do to serve others. Uh, many of you remember Dick Carlson. You know Dick Carlson. We showed his video a few sessions ago how for seven years, 24-7, he cared for his wife, B as she dealt with a degenerative disease. And finally, it took her life. But Dick lived with her, fed her, served her. And when we showed that video about his life, every man in this room said, I want to be that guy. 
I don't want to go through those circumstances if I don't have to, but I want to be that kind of a man. He is a great man. Aspire to greatness. That's what we want. Be unapologetically male. Secondly, be un unapologetically male by aspiring to strengthen, to strengthen others. And the example here is, I'll just kind of walk you through it, is, is Barnabas. Barnabas, by the way, is his nickname. His real name was Joseph. But they called him Barnabas. You know what it means? Son of encouragement. Wherever you have an oil well fire, call Barnabas. Barnabas is, is uh, first introduced in the New Testament in the early church when they were all living communally for a time because they, they, they had lost their homes and families and they were, they were sharing everything and it said Barnabas, who was from Cyprus, he wasn't even a native Israelite, he was from Cyprus, sold a field that he had and he gave all the proceeds to the church. He was a generous man. He strengthened the body of Christ. And then when a wild man, when a terrorist entered the family named Saul, and everybody was scared to death of this guy who'd been going around killing Christians, who are you going to call? <laughs> uh, Barney, Barnabas, they sent Barnabas to Saul. And Saul, or, and, and Barnabas brought him to the brothers, laid his own reputation on the line. And said, I want you to receive this man because I've looked at his life, I've heard his testimony, and he is a born-again believer. This is how Barnabas strengthened people around him. In chapter 11 in Acts, they, they needed to check out the, the Christians in Antioch, who were a couple hundred miles north. And so the apostles, who did they send? They sent Barnabas. Barnabas, go check that out. And then who was to go on the very first missionary journey to the Gentiles? Barnabas. This is a guy that strengthened everybody around him uh, wherever he went. And what, there's such strength in that man to build a bridge from his own experience and his own reputation to bring somebody else along and put that strength under that person. That's what encouragement does to people. This is what Barnabas did. Many of you know uh, Buzz Swanson. Uh, who used to attend Ironworks and t occasionally buzzes through here. He used his name as a, as a sound. <laughs> and uh, Buzz grew up in South Minneapolis, and uh, his dad passed away when he was about 10 years of age. And uh, Buzz got into some trouble. Now, some of you won't understand this. You're just too young, but uh, Buzz stole 100 hubcaps. That used to be the way... Entrepreneurs made some money. Yeah. We don't have hubcaps anymore, do we? We have steel wheels yes. and uh, mag wheels. But he stole 100 hubcaps from the airport, and he was selling these and uh, probably selling them back to the people that he stole them from. <laughs> and, uh, and the police found out about this, and a, a police officer named Mr. Johnson uh, uh, caught him one day, and he said, uh, go tell your mother I'm coming to your house. And uh, he sat down with them, and Buzz thought he was going to be arrested and thrown in life in prison and whatever, you know, he was scared to death. And here's what this Mr. Johnson said. Mrs. Swanson, you have a wonderful son, but he's made some mistakes. But he doesn't deserve to go to jail, and I think if he thinks it over, he'll change his behavior. And Buzz did. He admitted his mistake. He repented of it. He never did it again. This man could have swung the chainsaw of the law through him and cut him in half and, and done all kinds of things. But here was a man, even though he had the right to do it with his position in the law, came and he strengthened a single mom and her son and gave him a new lease on life. All around us are people who, who need to be strengthened. Some need mercy. Some need help. Uh, some need stewardship, but it's the, I want to hold the spotlight of honor on every man who is strengthening someone else. I want to be that guy, don't you? I, I want to be the man who can come alongside and provide. I want to be the man who has the capacity to protect, like Barnabas. 
I want to be the man who has the capacity to teach, to model, to mentor, to coach. I want to be the kind of man who has the capacity to connect, not only with other men, but connect other men to each other. And that's what Barnabas did. So lead courageously, men. And what that means is, not only do you serve, but you, when you serve, you bring something that lifts other men up. I want to be that man who strengthens. So, be unapologetically male, thirdly, by aspiring to responsibility. Aspiring to responsibility. Here's a name for your next son or grandson. Epaphroditus. <laughs> Epaphroditus. I don't know what they would call him on the football field, but listen to what Paul writes about him in Philippians chapter 2. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now what did Epaphroditus face? Lions? You know? Romans with swords? What was Epaphroditus doing? He was a messenger. <laughs> he was bringing the letters of Paul to the churches, and he fell ill. But he recovered, and he completed his mission. What I love about Epaphroditus is that, talk about no applause and no soundtrack. He's just a UPS guy. You know, he's bringing a message. But he took his responsibility seriously, and he almost died in the attempt. And Paul says... Honor such men who say, yes, I'll do it, and they complete the task. And my dad had the opposite saying of uh, the old American Express commercials that said, don't leave home without it. My dad had the expression when he'd send me for something, don't come home without it. <laughs> if we send you for something, get her done. And that's what a man wants to do. I want to take responsibility. There's some kind of load-bearing gene in every man. It says, give me the ball. I want to take the shot. Ask me to do something difficult because it's honoring to me and I will get it done. We aspire to that. We live in a culture that's, that's so leisure-oriented and so responsibility shirking that we've almost forgotten. This is what we want. Give me 160 acres and tell me I need to homestead this land because I want to take responsibility and build something here. Aspire to responsibility. Epaphroditus is a great example of this. And his name is written in the Bible. The UPS guy that is to be honored because he had a simple task. And even though he was sick unto death, he didn't forget to get it done. God spared him. He got his job done. And it was a blessing to Paul and to us because we now have the letters to Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians because he's the guy who carried those letters to the churches. So what's the essence of a marriage vow? It's taking responsibility to be faithful, to give your life to just one woman. What's the essence of fatherhood? It's taking the responsibility to provide and nurture and protect vulnerable young people. What's the essence of maturity? It's to keep growing. Take responsibility to grow for the rest of your life. What's the essence of wealth, <coughs> privilege, and all of our blessings? It's to take responsibility to steward that through all the different phases of it. And what's the essence of the gospel? It's to take responsibility, to live it,
pass it on. So, accept responsibility. And a man who takes the assignment and is willing to die in the attempt is a man who really literally is presenting his body as a living sacrifice, as acceptable to God. And that's the kind of man we want to be. The world needs men like this. And we want to be that kind of guy. So let's be unashamedly and unapologetically male, number four, by aspiring to oneness. Aspiring to oneness. If you uh, look at Acts chapter 18, we meet a man named Aquila. But look what happens to Aquila. We meet him in verse 2 of Acts chapter 18. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So it's Aquila and Priscilla, but look what happens in verse 18. And after this, Paul stayed many days longer, then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. Suddenly, Aquila is Priscilla's husband. <laughs> Same thing happens in verse 26. It says, uh, he began to speak boldly in the synagogues, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I just want to unashamedly, as a male, say I am proud to be known as Joanne's husband, <laughs> which is increasingly the case, <laughs> because she likes people, and she's friendly, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so she introduces me as, oh yeah, and here's uh, the guy, no, aspire to oneness. Here's what I love about Aquila and Priscilla is they didn't care which one came first or second. They did something together. There was something that they were doing together. Now, for you, it might not be ministry. It might not be mentoring Apollos into the way of the gospel. It might not be teaching formally. Every man I know wants to aspire to say, we're a team. This woman I married is one with me. I say this at many weddings to couples who are standing there and the bride is glowing and the groom is sweating. And I say to the bride, I hope if I bump into you in the airport in, a, in another year or so, and I ask you, how's your life going? That you can't describe your life more than two sentences before your husband's name comes into the picture. And I say the same thing to that groom. If I bump into you at Home Depot and say, how's it going? I hope you can't give me more than two sentences before your wife's name comes into that picture. Because your life has been given to this oneness. Now, I might be touching some places that are, that are pretty tender, and, and I don't want to just make this mythical oneness. But we have a saying in the Weekend to Remember, the Family Life Ministry, that you're either moving toward oneness or you're drifting toward isolation. So be unapologetically male. And get one ahead. Take a move toward oneness today, <clears throat> wherever you are. And it will not only make you feel like a man, it will show you to be a man. Because a man walks toward the fire. For many of you, that's exactly what it looks like. And the picture I have in my head is those New York firefighters who are walking toward the Twin Towers when everybody else is running away. Be unapologetically male and aspire to oneness. Reject passivity. And I love the fact that Aquila's identity was significantly tied to his wife. So do yourself a favor. Do your wife a favor, do your church a favor, do your children a favor, and love your wife. Aspire to oneness. Men, I think these are, these are callings. I don't know what shape it will take in your life to aspire to these things. But this is the design that God made for us. And it comes out in all kinds of testosterone-related activities, but it's, it, but it's 
fueled by the design that God made. And we should be unapologetic. This is what we're trying to do as men. This is what completes me as a man. This is what I want to be known for as a man. So I've written some questions here that I hope will uh, uh, elicit some lively conversation around your table as we think about what does it mean to be unapologetic. The world needs us. The world needs me. The world needs you. We need to be men that God has called and designed so that we can enter this world and make a difference. So talk around your tables. Enjoy one another. And uh, we'll see you in a few minutes.